Hey guys, Alex Radcliffe here, and it's time for another Kickstarter roundup, another group of Kickstarter board games that we're going to go over, take a quick look at, and I'll give you my two cents, my own opinion on whether they are good backs or not. If you're new to this channel, if you're new here, I'm looking at these not just from a lens of are they good or not, which is generally very hard to do with a game people don't actually have, but more specifically, I tend to look more at the value proposition. Is this a good use of your money and why? Is this a company that's asking you to back their game, to give up your money for a year, to, to give them the money itself, to relying on the fact that the game has no reviews, are they giving you a reason to do that? Or are they just relying on good faith and FOMO? Now that aside, let's start start off with the Hunters AD 2114, 21, 2114. This is a game that's actually over, but whenever I have a change of opinion, whenever I, I've solidified something I'm doing, I like to update you guys. Now I posted this in the comments in a previous video, but the Hunters I ended up going in on in the end. Uh, in the last video, which I'll link up to above, I commented how it was appealing, it was interesting, but there's there's just too many, too many games out there, and you're going to have to cut some things here and there. But the amount of overwhelming support for this game was just way too much. Every single person commented positively about how good the game is from those that have experienced it. And if you look at Board Game Geek, the only negative comment I found in the first few pages of reviews was someone who's upset they were doing a second Kickstarter. So overall, this this game has a lot of love, and so I I took the I took the leap. I backed it, and we'll let you know how that goes. Next up, another update from a previous video is Euthia Torment of, of Resurrection. This one, I, I don't have a finalized decision on what I'm doing, but I am leaning towards passing this on the end. In, in the end, in the last video, I commented how I felt it looked like a good game. It looked like an interesting game. I'm someone who enjoys Runebound. I enjoy Mage Knight. And this looked like kind of a middle point between the two. So I am and was interested. I was and am interested in the game. But I also commented how I didn't think the price point was great. I thought it was decent. But it's ultimately going to come down to how well the game is received. How good it is. This is not a game that's going to just inherently hold its value in my opinion. But rather a game that the value will be directly related to how well the game is received. How good it is out the gate. And in that sense, I'm just, I'm seeing a lot, again, I haven't made a final decision here, but there is a lot going on in this game, and while I am interested, I'm worried that there might be too much going on and or too much legwork. I mean, the the, ver the various playthroughs alone were, were fairly, fairly long and involved for both solo and two players. It, it's a lot going on here. I am leaning towards not backing it, just because I'm not sure if it's a great buy, and I'm sure I'll be able to get it later if I need to, so... No firm answer there, but just my two cents. Next up, we have Asonia. Now, Asonia, by the time this video goes live, you're probably going to have less than a day left to back. And Asonia is, I mean, this is a tough one. This is one where I may very well break my own rule of the value proposition. So let's go into that, which is Asonia is basically a drafting game. Nothing, not drafting, sorry, not drafting. It is a deck building game in the vein of Dominion, in the vein of, uh, what's it called? Um, Dale of Merchants, uh, any, of, any of these, well, just deck building games. But it looks very, very accessible and has a lot of interesting things going for it. So to start with, one of the things I really enjoy is this is a deck building game with multiple currencies, which is, it has been done before, but it's not the norm. It's not the norm where you have a deck building game where buying things has separate different currencies to buy things. And the reason for that is, is inherent because there's only so many cards you can draw around. It's hard enough to balance giving players the option of doing everything while not like well, while giving the depth uh, of having multiple currencies. So in Dominion, if you have to rely on having different currencies, it further cramps your ability to buy things. This game seems to be handling that primarily by having most things cost not that much. So nothing's too expensive, but they give you multiple currencies, including wilds that you can play with. But it, it's if you watch the Rados playthrough, he goes through it. He clearly likes it. And honestly, I was very interested in his opinion because the main reason I was interested in it was because of Dale of Merchants, which is a very light, accessible deck builder that I enjoy. I know Rado does as well. And so I was curious what his opinion was specifically on this game. And I, I currently am backing it. I'm having... Very, I'm, I'm wrestling with myself on this because the value from a value proposition, I don't think it's worth it. From a value proposition, you're looking at, I mean, to get the the master tier with everything, which I think is the best buy, just because of the expand, the shipping costs, it, it, it's the shipping cost for the master tier is going to be comparable to the shipping cost for even the smaller ones. So I, I think the master tier is the best buy. But the master tier is coming in at fifty dollars for basically the deck building, that the game itself, plus two small expansions. I do not think that is a good buy. I just want to be very clear. And then plus shipping costs is going to be added later. So, you know, you're looking at like 60 bucks for essentially Dale of Merchants Plus. 
that doesn't strike me. And and, and to, to kick it off as well, like they have things like the 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 way you measure your score is with card trackers, like tr card trackers akin to uh, Star Realms. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. The, I cannot see a picture offhand, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't look like they're giving you a ton of value for that, except for the fact that the game might be really good. Uh, I am probably... Oh, here we go. Here's the card tracker. You see over here, we have 60 and 0 over here. I mean, this is... It's not something that screams, pay $60 to get me. But I like the look of the game. And this might be a classic, uh, you know, piece of chocolate cake is on the table. I know it's bad for me. I know it doesn't make sense. But I might eat it anyway. I do do that from time to time. I do occasionally break my, my own rules of, is this worth it? And then I just go with the fact that, you know, treat yourself. So, treat, well, I said that poorly. From Parks and Recreation, treat yourself, treat yourself. Anyways, I probably am backing this, but I am hesitant to... I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence. I am on the fence. Uh, next up, we have Canvas. Canvas is an interesting one. Canvas is coming in with 500k, 500k raised so far, 460k. And that's because it is currently... It's currently bridging that line between gamers, people like you and me who are, you know, interested in the game, but also non-gamers. I mean, if you watch the Kickstarter video, it doesn't have the person pulling the game off a shelf of games. It has them pulling off it off a shelf of puzzles, which really screams home that this is being targeted to not just gamers. Uh, the, the basic idea of the game is it has a, a card pulling row. Let me see if I can find a picture over here. It has, here we go, you can see over here, it has a card pulling row where you try, you, have, you want to get certain cards, but you have to put down tokens on prior cards to get that card. Akin to Small Rule, to Century Spice Road, and you, it's, it's a concept that's been done before, but it's combining that with different forms of artwork that combine to create this abstract art. So there's, there's a gaming aspect, but there's also a visual aspect that's very attractive. I am very interested in this game. I will 100% be getting it at some point because... I think my daughter would love playing this. I think she'd love just the. I, she'd love just combining the cards and then combine it with the game aspect. I think she'd really enjoy it. I think I'd enjoy it as well. So I am very interested in it, but I am not backing it. I just don't think the value is there. Uh, I started to. I, I started to get interested when they had these premium components, and then I saw the premium components are another pledge tier. So I really don't think the value is there, considering they're asking. Uh, let me see if I can find the basic one. They're asking $30 plus shipping just to get this. It's another $10 to get another exclusive 10 cards. And then it's more than that. It's $43 or $49 to get the premium components. So what they're effectively doing here, which kind of blows my mind, is they're giving you those Kickstarter extras in the sense of extra cards, nicer components, but they're charging you extra tiers to get them. And not like a basic game where they where they give you like a, a standard tier and a deluxe tier. They're, they, they seem to be asking a deluxe price and then charging an additional level on top of that to get the, the extras. Uh, I was pretty turned off by the price on this. I'm sure I'll get it cheaper later. And I'm not emotionally invested enough like I was with Asonia to take that plunge. So I am currently not backing Canvas. Next up, we have Rise of Tribes, Beasts, and Bronze. Now, I'm going to start with a giant disclaimer here. I did not like Rise of Tribes. Not I didn't think it was that great. I didn't think it was amazing and there are better games. I just thoroughly just didn't enjoy it. I felt that the gameplay was, to me, it was, I'm hesitant to say, this is a 7.3 on Board Game Geek. That's a decent rating. That's not a bad rating by any means. I personally did not feel the gameplay was inspired. I felt it took aspects of other games that have been done better and then the only parts that were its own spin i felt were not good um so i i really didn't like this game so i heavily suggest taking this opinion with a grain of salt because of that um in terms of the value proposition this is an ex this is the the, the the game of rise of tribes but it's an additional beasts and bronze expansion I'll, I'll be frank i have not looked into what the expansion does or doesn't do just because um, like i said for myself i'm not that interested i didn't want to go into a deep dive um, in terms of pricing, in terms of the, the value proposition, they're basically asking $89 for the simultaneous for both the base game and the expansion, or $32 for just the expansion. Now, as usual, factor this in. Shipping costs are shipping costs. At $32 for the premium co the components for the expansion, for the, you know, the extras and the updates, I don't think it's a terrible price. I don't think it's a great price. It'll be available cheaper for sure with the non-deluxe extras, but it will be, um, even the deluxe extras, you'll probably be able to get at secondary market pretty easily. This is a game that has, again, it's liked. It's not a poorly done game. It's not a game that's that's being vilified all over the place. It is liked, but my my experience has been that the secondhand market on Rise of Tribes, Tribes was asking the same or less price than the Kickstarter. It was not being more, it was being same or less, often less. And in terms of that, that you know, that deluxe bundle of hair for $89, again, once you factor in shipping, it's $99. Do you really think you can't get this after the fact 
on the secondary market if you want the deluxe stuff or even less for regular retail. I don't think the value proposition is here. But again, as with many of these Kickstarters, it's not that they're hugely expensive. It's that you're being asked to give up your money a year in advance and you're being asked to give up your money with a lack of reviews and you're being asked to basically pay 10 to $15 more than it will cost you later, which basically is just a non-win all around. It's not the end of the world. You're not, you know, losing your home or anything like that. But I just don't see why you would do it with exceptions. So, for instance, with myself, I am willing to do it. I'm probably doing it with Asonia just because I'm willing to grant myself the occasional illogical decision because I'll get it, you know, right away. I'll get it sooner than everyone else and I, I, I won't have to have any FOMO while I watch other people playing it in other forms. I'm willing to give myself that once in a while, but most of the time I need the reviews, I need the value proposition, I need the extras, I need something to really justify it most of the time. But yeah, that's that's Rise of Tribes. Next up, we have Mini Express. Mini Express, these are the same guys who did Mini Rails. They're the same guys who did the Flow of History. Both the company and the designer both did Flow of History and Mini Rails. And this one looks intriguing, honestly. I mean, I, I have liked most of the train games I've played. My personal favorite, it's not... A typical train game. I, my personal game that I like the most in the genre is Steam, but I've enjoyed Chicago Rails. I've enjoyed, there are others I'm blanking on. I've played a few train games. I haven't played any of the super heavy ones. They're on my list, but uh, in terms of the lighter train games, I have played a bunch of them. I like the concept and I am interested in Mini Express. The basic idea is you have a train map and you have stock taking companies. This is nothing new. This is typical train game genre or 18xx genre, I should say. And the basic idea of this game is you take two actions. Let me see if I can find it over here. You take two actions on your turn. You either build tracks, which is you, t you choose one company that has available train tokens, then you build a new connection. So you see it's putting down all the trains for that connection. And then you increase the track length marker by the number of hexes in between. That's action one. You, you're only choosing two actions. Okay, there's only two actions on the, on the table. The second action is you buy shares. You choose a company with shares left, and then you reduce your compensation if you if the chosen company still has train co tokens. Okay, and then you add train tokens to the supply. So it's this give and take of building up the 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 stock of a company while getting invested in the company. But it seems to be seems to be very simple yet elegant it's it's it dumbs it down to just two decisions but obviously there's more than two because which stock company do you choose where do you put the trains what do you do with that it really looks very appealing to me i am tempted to back it i don't think i will i i'll, I'll update you in the next video if i do but i don't think i'm going to back this because again value prop i'm not tempted enough and the value proposition is okay the value proposition is you're basically paying 39 dollars uh, off the msrp of 60 dollars plus shipping, so you're basically paying $49 on a $60 MSRP, and you tell me, is $49 on an MSRP of $60, is that worth it? Is that, you know, more expensive? I mean, for me, my own experience, you'll be able to get it for $40 to $45 after the fact, and that's with free shipping on a larger order or whatnot. Again, not a super high premium at all, but there are so many good games that, for the most part, with very few exceptions, I don't feel the need to take those chances. I don't feel the need to constantly overload my collection with stuff a year in advance uh, for that for a lack of a value proposition. So that is Mini Express. Looks great. If you're interested, go ahead and back it. Again, I don't think it's a big ask. I am tempted on this one. It looks very, 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 it looks very simple and engaging. Next up, we have curators, 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 curators. I'm losing my ability to speak cleanly now. Clearly, see, I'm gone. Curators is currently, uh, it's at twenty four thousand dollars of seventeen thousand dollars. Not very highly backed. Uh, it, it, this is interesting. It's intriguing. I will, not, I'll, I'll, I will be passing on it. The gameplay itself looks fairly intriguing. They have this interesting concept of these tokens you use to you, the different roles that you use them and then you flip them. But if you ever have two tokens that are the same type, you can effectively flip them and they can take a double value. It's got an interesting little selection thing. You can watch the, there's a video on this page somewhere here that explains it. The actual gameplay really comes down to just, you know, growing your museum and throw, using those different roles to grow your museums, get visitors, get money, and to obviously win the game. It looks interesting. It looks engaging. I'm certainly interested in trying it out. Uh, for me, it's a combination of the low funding just makes me really worried. This is not going to get off the ground, not going to have the kind of support that you really need. And also price point. I just don't think the price point is there. Uh, the, the standard edition, Curators, where is it? I saw it over here a second. The regular standard edition is $42. It, I don't think that the game like this should be $42 and again factor in shipping after the fact from the component stance in terms of what they have component wise it doesn't seem like it makes sense uh, I think this will either be available after the fact or it won't have been good enough 
Like they talk about in the, in the comments below about how they're a small publisher, so you might not see it later. And that's true. If you like the look of this game and you're worried about seeing it later, go ahead, go and back it. Doesn't seem crazily priced. At the same time, I generally feel that when a game isn't going to be seen again later, unless it's a specifically Kickstarter exclusive with intent, with as a marketing pitch, they make a Kickstarter exclusive. But when they rely on the fact that it may or may not be, if it's a good enough game, you'll see it later. And it doesn't mean it'll be a bad game, but if it's good enough, you'll see it later. So I'm passing on Curators. Does look interesting. So we'll see what happens there. Next up, we have Crash at Steamfall. Crisis at Steamfall is really a, the Genesis expansion. This is an expansion to Crisis at Steamfall. I, I'm only really including this because someone asked me to include this one, it, it become, primarily because it's an expansion, and honestly, I don't know enough about it. What I will say is it, the game itself is not greatly rated. Decently rated, 6.6. .6. There's obviously enough people who liked it or liked the look of it that they're, they're pledging on the expansion. In terms of the value proposition, the value proposition is sort of there. Now, what I mean by that is... The gameplay visually looks like a game that is intriguing to me, but speaking frankly, my, I guess, elitist snobby, snobby aspect, a game that's a 6.6 .6 on Board Game Geek, I need someone who I, whose value, who, sorry, I need someone whose opinion I know I share to tell me that I should play that game. So for instance, uh, Besiege is, a, I think, one of the lowest games in my collection in terms of the rating, and I try that one because someone whose opinion I know that I share similar game taste with them said it's worth trying, you should give it a go. Anything below a 7, I kind of need a testimonial from someone else before I'm willing to take the plunge. And I don't have that on this one, at least not yet. And so I haven't taken the plunge on trying this one or been interested in this one. Uh, Gameplay-wise, art-wise, this is beautifully done. These miniatures, very steampunky, very nice. Uh, from a visual aspect, I would be totally behind this game. It's just the low rating that has pushed me away. Uh, in terms of the value proposition, the value proposition is kind of there because it's just not available anywhere else. Meaning... I don't know whether it should or shouldn't cost this much, but it's currently not a game that has been available. If you try to look for it to buy it, it's just not easily available at a cheaper price. It's available, you can definitely find it, but it's not a game that's easily available. And so I have a hard time saying that the value proposition isn't there because it very well might be just through the lack of supply alone. Uh, I don't, I didn't do a huge deep dive into this one, so I could definitely be wrong about it. But from what I saw, it seems like the, the price point's okay because of supply and demand, because of a lack of availability. So if you like the look of this, go ahead and back it. I think, I think the value's there. Uh, for, me, for myself, I would, I would recommend doing a lot of research to see why are you backing a game that's rated a 6.6? .6? Whose opinion influenced you to do that? Uh, nothing against them. I wish them all the best. I wish all companies the best. I want everyone to be as successful as possible. But for yourself, what's the pull? What, why? I'm a little torn on that one. So anyways, that's my two cents. And next up, this is one of the most requested ones that's been on my list again and again and again, is Adventures in Neverland. Adventures in Neverland is a story-driven adventure game, so very heavily focused on the, sto on the story. And for myself, I will not be backing this for a combination of two reasons. First of all is the theme of Adventures in Neverland has no appeal to me. The game looks gorgeous. I love the artwork, I love the map, but the theme really has so little interest to me, it's almost a turn-off. Meaning, I, I know that I was very into um, the Alice, Alice in Wonderland game, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, uh, Wonderland's War. I was very interested in Wonderland's War, I did a video on it, I'll link that up above. Wonderland's War was a theme that very much appealed to me. It's just a personal preference. I found Wonderland's War to be a fascinatingly well-done theme versus uh, Peter Pan and Captain Hook just doesn't do it for me on a personal level. In terms of the other aspect, the value proposition, same, same as usual. I don't think... Well, I should give you a caveat to that. There are multiple pledge levels, and I would say for sure you should be avoiding the retail pledge levels. Anything to do with the retail pledge levels, I recommend heavily avoiding no value there whatsoever. I mean, you're saving £10 off the MSRP of 60 to, uh, 55 so £65. Pounds, you're sorry, yeah, £65, pounds, you're paying 55 but plus shipping. So there's literally no discount. No discount whatsoever. Meaning you're going to be able to get this cheaper without a doubt in my mind. Which means the only reason to pledge that right now is just the that the that you want it earlier. You're backing it without a discount, with no, not enough reviews, not not enough popular opinions as to how good the game is. I recommend heavily to avoid the retail version. Now it seems like most backers agree with me because there's only 140 backers that chose this, and another 50 or so that chose the the next one, the the retail plus booster. Ironically, the retail plus booster I think is a better buy. But anyways, if you're going to back this. Back it in either of the deluxe editions, either the, the regular deluxe explorer, which is the base game with all the deluxe fight components, or the deluxe plus all the boosters, which is going to be what's it called, ninety nine dollars, about hundred dollars American or whatnot. And this, the most backers did back at this pledge level, so at least the ones who are backing it are 
doing what I think is the best buy, but it, it's, I think that the price point is not there considering the components. If it's a good enough game, then those deluxe components, those rarefied components will help. I mean, we see this in a lot of games where when you have a game that isn't necessarily good, a deluxified edition doesn't do much for it. But when a game is good, that deluxified edition is sought after. Like we see that with a lot of like the TMG deluxified games, this happens a lot in. Not good TMG deluxified game, cheaper than retail. A uh, great TMG deluxified game, the deluxified version becomes even more sought after and really holds its value. So with the regular deluxified games, it really comes down to how good the game is. It's possible these will hold their value. The deluxe versions, uh, the, all the extras, if this game is well done, if this game is good, which it seems to be, then they'll probably hold their value. I think you'll still be able to get it the same or cheaper with more reviews later. So the combination of that and just not being myself pulled into the theme, that's why I'm not backing it. But if you are interested in this, back it at the deluxe level, even if you don't like it. Meaning, if you like it, you have the deluxe extras, and if you don't like it, then you can sell it for actually a profit, or the same, not profit, but the profit or the same price, as opposed to if you buy the retail price, the retail ones, you're just straight out of money at that point. So that's Adventures in Neverland. It looks very interesting, by the way. It looks like a good hybrid of gameplay and story. I am someone who's not so into story. I like story if it's augmented by good gameplay, but I hate story if it's just on its own. But if it were a different theme, I'd be more interested. And finally, last on this list, it's a long video, we have Victim the Cursed Force and the Asylum Expansion. Victim the Cursed Force is very interesting. It's very... It, the, the art style doesn't appeal to me personally, but the gameplay does, and yet I'm not backing it. And the reason for that is because... this is Let's cover the game. The, ga the game is basically a... It starts off as a cooperative game, but one player is going to turn, and then you are you have to try to get out. It ends up, it's, it's a one versus many game, similar to Betrayal House on the Hill. It has that aspect. You're exploring on a, you're exploring on a map. It's an anime art. I'm trying to find the map here. Yeah, you're, you're going through this forest over here, trying to effectively escape the forest. Now, the game, the first of all, again, art, art-wise, I'm not into anime and anime style in general. Uh, I don't know if I have anything in my collection that's like that. Uh, maybe the closest thing I really do like is Madara. Madara's art style I do enjoy, but I would say most things in that vein I don't personally enjoy. But that itself is not really the reason here. The reason is the gameplay from what I saw looked just, just fiddly enough that combine that with the price point, and I think this is going to end up being one of those games where how good it is is going to be a huge factor in in how well it does after the fact. Now, it sounds a little weird to say how good a game is is related to the price. That's inherent. But with Kickstarter games, it's actually not that inherent right away. You can have bad Kickstarter games that people want them and they're sought after, that they will hold their value as long as they're not terrible. Meaning you could have, like, let's say Reichbusters, which I dumped on a lot in my one of my previous reviews i don't think rackbusters is a bad game at all but i think rackbusters has a lot of critical flaws that in a non-kickstarter game would make it a non-starter versus in a kickstarter game with tons of minis and production value and i mean i'm into it i was yeah i was into the that art style myself not the the art the miniatures i was into that world but so yeah you get a, you kind of get a pass on being an amazing game you allowed a certain amount of flaws when you have that much of a of a world or that much of a beautiful game going on. Uh, for this particular game, I think it's not going to get that pass. I think it's really very strongly going to be dependent on how good a game it is. This is a this style of gameplay doesn't get leeways for being okay but not really good enough. Too much fiddliness, too much imbalance, those things can really destroy the game. And the combination of, of that plus the price point, which is not cheap, I, I, I just I'm passing on it. I think it will be a good buy if it's a great game. I think it'll hold its value if it's a great game, but it will probably not if it isn't. And it just looks a tad too fiddly for me, for me to think that it's really going to be something that sticks around. That's it. That's a lot, long video, one of the longer, one of my uh, Kickstarter roundup videos. I hope you enjoyed. Um, there's links down to the Kickstarters down below. Heads up, just a disclaimer. On Asonia, the link on Asonia, if enough people buy something, I do get a free copy. I want to be very clear and transparent. Uh, in general, by the way, I'll make a note now, uh, the only time I've ever done anything for any sort of compensation so far was Storm Sunder, where I sought out them to give a paid review. I wanted to, I specifically wanted to promote the game because I liked the game so much, so I basically asked them for a discount on a pledge if I do a whole write-up on them. Uh, I will only ever do that if I like, well, I shouldn't say only, until I change my policies and just do paid previews, which I'll let you know if I do, but as of right now, I will only ever do something like that if I am interested in the game. Uh, Asonia, they had a referral link so i didn't mess with them i just have a referral link on the kickstarter i put it down below uh in general i'm going to try to be as transparent as possible if or when i ever do things like that but my goal and my expectation is that i will i don't want to do paid previews in a typical sense i don't mind reaching out to something that i'm super into already 
to try to figure out some sort of uh, compensation or whatnot. But I really, I, I am very, very hesitant of diving down that rabbit hole. I can tell you already from having a few publishers message me here and there, even just being asked, forget paid previews, even just being asked to do uh, to do a review, even being given a, a copy by that person or publisher or company, it really biases you a lot. It's easy to be critical of a game when you, you're you not face-to-face -face with the creators. It's very easy. To, I, I don't mean bashing. I don't mean the uh, anonymity of the internet. I just mean it's easier to say, listen, I don't think this is a good buy. But as soon as somebody has given you that game to review it, it's suddenly so much harder to be trans transparent and honest. And I really, really don't want to lose that at all. So again, I will be transparent as to when or if it happens. But my goal is to never let it bias my opinion. And if any of you see that it is in any way, let me know. I, I, I very much want to stay on the side of here's my opinion. It is what it is. While being polite and reasonable and respectful of everyone involved. Again, Alex Radcliffe, Board Game Co. You can subscribe down below. You can watch uh, you can uh, like this video comment all that stuff share it with somebody else check out more videos i have on the channel lots of kickstarter stuff coming up and we're going to have a video of hell coming up soon as well so that's basically it until next time i'm alex